if, if I go back again, like you're saying, of where it all started and, and the passion for cars, if I look at, look at what I've done in the last few years, I never knew that there's a career like this, that it didn't even existed. Like you say, for, for our people from our community, we are only exposed to being a mechanic, a panel beater, a plumber, electrician. And if you're a school teacher, then you're like, you know, up there, if you're a doctor, then you're super up there. But majority of us, you know, we got the normal job. Many years ago, I held a position of training officer uh, at the National Television Video Association, the Western Cape chapter. And I initiated a training project where, with the support of a lot of industry suppliers, where we got our student members to physically use the equipment to produce music videos. The NTV Music Video Workshop has been designed in such a way as to give the students the opportunity to actually do the work. And that's why we call it the one-to-one uh, -one workshop. And the professionals were there to assist the student, not like the norm with these type of workshops where students are required to watch um, what the professional does. Although it also has its benefits, but it's better if you, if you give the students the opportunity, opportunity to get physically involved because you learn, as we all know, the best way to learn in this industry is hands-on. But one of the conditions from one of the suppliers Back then, they were called MCC Logical. Um, for me to get access to the big cranes and dollies um, was to use experienced grip, key grip guys to actually operate the cranes and the dollies. And that's how I met my next guest. Salam, Nazmi, how are you doing? Good Salam, brother. Nazmi, for the benefit of people who don't really understand um, the role of a key grip. Please explain to us what does a key grip do? Sure. Um, after all these years, I still don't know what I'm really supposed to do. <laughs> but in my opinion, I guess I, I look after the safety of the camera and everyone surrounding the camera. I look after the safety of people on set if I feel that it's a, a danger for them to be in a specific position. I need to let them know that they don't need to be there. But basically, movement of the camera, wherever the camera is going, whether it's static on the tripod, whether it's in a handheld mode on a DOP, and I have to support him to see that he doesn't trip. And then we get dollies, which goes on tracks. We've got cranes, which we can move around as well, swing around, take up to high positions. Um, rigging cameras on cars, on trains, on aeroplanes, um, boats. All that kind of things. Wherever the camera's got to go, I, I, I think I need to look at the safety of will the system work? Can it work for the shot? And uh, how, how am I going to be able to do it? my problem just to make that happen, yeah. My memories of you, you and your brother especially, is the fact that you guys are always carrying the heaviest things on set and you're always carrying it with the biggest smiles also on set. And that, this is always very early in the morning and I look at you outside and I'm like, how can you look that happy? <laughs> yeah, I guess if you if you start thinking of it in a different way and we say, um, Alhamdulillah, you know what, we have the strength, the health to get up in the morning and do these things. That is part of our rizik, you know, and everything else is a bonus. So I, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that's sick, that's not healthy, that can't even get up out of their beds. So if we can get up and actually go and do that kind of hard work and earn honest money for the day, then yeah, why not smile? We should be grateful and say shukar, you know, that um, we've, we've got that strength to do that and to keep on smiling, be humble and kind and uh, always show people that, you know what, we can do it. The industry was still very close to people of color at that stage. And how, what was your first break? How did you get to your first break within the industry? I, I, I met a guy in, in, uh, in a scrapyard. If I must tell you, I was collecting scrap on, on the streets to make money. And <clears throat> before collecting scrap, I was a spray painter panel beater. So I've always had a passion for cars. And having this passion for cars on high school, there was one incident where the teacher says, you're never going to make it in life. All you do is talk cars. cars. And alhamdulillah, today I'm still talking cars, you know. So 
when I met this guy in the scrap yard, he was an American guy, and I thought, let me speak to him about classic car because I was busy restoring uh, the car. We became good friends, and he was like a, a, a model, uh, an artist in the film industry, and his girlfriend was a casting director. So I was really struggling while going on the streets, picking up tins to make money and scrap and selling it and whatever like that, you know, things wasn't working out. But there was a reason why our creator sent me that way in life to struggle, go down to the scrapyards, but then I had to meet this guy. So he came up to me one day and said, um, come and work for my girlfriend. You know, she's a casting director and she can offer you a job as an extra. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but you know what, times are tough. If it's going to give me an honest living and something for the day, then yeah, let me go and do it. You know? So <clears throat> off I went and I was an extra and I saw all these cameras in the background and the people with cranes and dollies. And, and I was like, wow, I never knew that the film industry like this existed in South Africa. I've only seen it on the movies, you know, the behind the scenes. And then I did a few more jobs as an extra and I asked him, look, I want to get where those guys are. How do I get there? And he said, look, he's going to give me some agencies, uh, contacts. And I went. And everyone wanted the experience. And I, obviously, I never had any experience of, of how those things work. And when I came to the last agency, I just told them, look, you know what? If it takes me to work for free to get some experience, I'll do that. And they said they let me know. And that was with Radical Crew. Um, and a week later, they called me up to say, look, they've got a job here, a small job for me. And because of my spray painting experience, um, I need to auto detail cars. And I said, that's fine. <clears throat> I can wash cars, you know, that's the easiest job I can do. And so off I went and I went to go and wash the cars. And this guy was teaching me that I was working with. And a week later, he, so I'm still doing my training with him. And then he told that production company, look, yeah, just keep this guy on um, as he knows what to do now. He can carry on with the job. So Alhamdulillah, that one week, then three months, I worked for Audi. I did all the prototypes um, and they paid me that it wasn't for free events, even though I went there with working for free. So I got paid and I was blown away, worked long hours, but I, I earned good money there compared to what I was doing. And I was like, wow, this, this people are maybe paying me too much money. So I would sometimes watch this car three times a day, just in case they come back and say, we paid you too much money. And um you know, we need to get some money back. And I got something to say. This time, but I washed the car three times. Uh, you know, I really need this money to help out my family. So that is where that started. And I did that for a few years. And uh, then I started PAing. And then eventually, you know, while I'm on set, I started realizing where I was being comfortable and what I wanted to do. You know? So the gripping side was me working with my hands. <clears throat> I've always grown up, you know, working on cars. So working with the hands is a comfortable uh, position to be so from there onwards it, it was just hard work and, and working with all the old key groups that was around in Cape Town that taught me everything that they knew and I've learned a bit from every one of them and started my own way of getting to the top of the game as well I'm still trying to get there and still struggling but alhamdulillah we every day is a, it's a learning curve you know so from that start you end up working on some of the biggest commercials, some of the biggest movies. I mean, there's a, I, I looked at your, uh, your, 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 your credit list, um, some amazing movies. I mean, so, so before we go into the, 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 the area that you're now specializing, um, how do we always learn with every production, the new challenges, the new demands, and then you, we take the, the basic knowledge we have, and then we, apply it to situ situations that then gains you more uh, uh, experience. Um, from all these movies that you, especially in the early part, not, not in the later part, um, what kind of experiences do you remember that just stands out and you go, yes, like that. I was glad I experienced that because it gave me the base, the, uh, the foundation to do the next thing. You know what I mean? Sure. I get asked that question so many times, eh? and I think every job, there, there's a different experience, you know, and things which I maybe thought 10 years ago was the way to do it, I've just learned now recently that, no, there's a better way to do it, 
And sometimes it's not just from me, but maybe it's like from my assistant that's working with me. And he goes, Buddha, um, why don't, can we maybe do it this way as well? Then I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. But yes, you're actually correct. Let's start using your system. You know, so every job has a unique experience to me, man. Um, if, if, I, if I go back again, like you're saying, of where it all started and, and the passion for cars, if I look at, look at what I've done in the last few years, I never knew that there's a career like this, that it didn't even existed. Like you say, for, for our people from our community, we are only exposed to being a mechanic, a panel beater, plumber, electrician. And if you're a school teacher, then you're like, you know, up there, if you're a doctor, then you're super up there. But majority of us, you know, we got the normal job. So to have landed up in this career, it's, it's still mind-blowing to me. It's still a dream, even though I know I'm loving it every day. But I've worked with amazing uh, car people. You know, if, if I look at movies like Fast and Furious, there's drivers that drove those cars, like Reese Millen, um, Dyer. I've worked with those guys. I've chased them on commercials in Cape Town for BMW. And that was for me like, am I actually really doing this? Am I being paid to do this? You know, so in the last few years, I've been dreaming of building camera cars and Alhamdulillah, I've achieved that now finally. And I get to drive that, that car and chase these guys. And they teach me, this is how you're going to be chasing me. This is where it's safe. So I'm getting exposed to international standards all the time. I've, I've done a few uh, Red Bull uh, events as well, where I'm chasing Red Bull athletes doing drifting you know, with their cars. I've just done one in Durban, and that was mind-blowing as well. Um, so, yes, like every job, you know, it just gets closer and closer. And I must say something that, alhamdulillah, that every dream I've had, I have fulfilled. And I do believe every other one is still coming. And if it's not coming, it wasn't. But you know what? It, it's been an amazing journey. If, if, if I could give this opportunity to every kid that's out there just to see that it's not just what we see in our neighborhoods, that is what we have to do. There's actually a different world out there. And if you can make a living from doing what you love, you're not really working. You know, it's, it's, sometimes it's a lot of stress. But I also do believe that our creator will never give me a job if I can't deal with it. So when I go into that job, I feel like, wow, the, the, everything is falling on me and how am I going to deal with it? But I have succeeded and I've fulfilled it and I've come out always on the other side successfully. And I say, you know, shukr to our creator for that, for, you know, for always giving me that inner strength to achieve that. Because like you know, we deal with a lot of different types of people. So keeping that smile on your face and just tawakaling, you know, in Allah, you know, for, for giving us strength. I think that is my strongest point in life. Is, is my daddy always said, you know, if you have Allah first, everything else will follow. Me. So that has been a big thing for me, uh, how to achieve things in life. Yeah. So you were just mentioning now uh, terms that obviously is natural for you, um, you know, when you said chasing and but just, just, I just want to see if my understanding is correct, especially in explaining it to our viewers. So you basically are doing the, the, the camera work or the grip work that helps the camera to capture all those fast chasing sequences that we see in movies like Fast and Furious, those action sequences in the car, or just even something as simple as people having a conversation within the car, and the camera is positioned to get the the, the conversation. Is is that my is my understanding hundred percent correct? Yes, that's exactly it. So whenever we're watching a movie where you see these cars are racing one another or chasing one another, there has to be another car that chases them to film them. And that is where I come in, basically. I, I was first the one, obviously, I still do it, mounting the cameras on the chase cars. And in the last few years now, I've been getting the opportunity of actually driving that car as well and, and chasing those cars. So I get to race with these guys and, and I'm being paid for it, you know. And like, it is very dangerous, but if you feel comfortable in what you are doing, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're going to achieve a good job from it. But if you're not feeling comfortable, in something, then don't attempt it. You know, first, like I said, it must be a natural feeling, and and alhamdulillah, yeah, I get to do that. So that is my role right now. <laughs> yeah, so so Mal, 
So, but then also, I remember back in the day, um, you're sharing this amazing story with me, again, with your car, your love for cars, you one day decided after a good season, the commercial season in South Africa, in Cape Town, you decided to buy your plane ticket and you're going to go to the States because you wanted to learn about those, how do you call those bouncing cars that we see so in the American movies, like in... in low America. riders, yeah. The lots of low riders. Uh, like, uh, yeah. you know, we see that so in the... In the, the what's it? Uh, Boys in the Wood, I think it was in there and stuff like yes. that. So just yes. share with us that experience because you became a low rider specialist here in, in South Africa doing that. So how did you learn that? Yeah. That was an amazing story. Please share that with us. Um... Yeah, there as well. You know, I was I was about fifteen when I saw a magazine, a lowrider magazine, at a, a cousin's house. You know, and and when I went through that, I said, you know, I would like to do a car like this one day. And then that dream started just working every day, man. Saying, how do I achieve that? Where do I even find that car in this country? You know. And as time was going on, and I was doing spray painting, um, I started looking, and I went to car shows and flashy cars so that I would see it, but there are cars like this. So um, doing the research, trying to find something like that, I eventually could afford to buy an old body like that. And I did a movie in Namibia. Yeah, I spent six months there working with Americans and I told them like, yeah, I want to come to your country and learn this. And they kept on saying, you must come, you must come. So after that movie, I thought, yeah, let me do this. Let me buy the ticket. Um, let me then save up to go. And I went and I knocked on their doors eh? <laughs> because they said I must come. So I used the opportunity and they were all shocked. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, I said, I'm coming to learn. So, you know, show me the way, you know. So I was very blessed there again. You know, my daddy said, um, if you do good, man, good will come your way. But I never saw it coming my way. But going to America and knocking on those people's doors, they opened up their doors for me. Eh? They gave me a bed to sleep in. I remember the one DOP is like, you came at the right time. I'm leaving for Italy so you can walk up to my house. I was like, how blessed is this for me, man? It's a blessing that I never saw coming, you know? So I was in, in California. Um, this was in 1999 when I went the first time. Yeah. And the guy that helped me there, it was an ex-South African guy as well. Um, I told him, look here, you're staying in, uh, in uh, Hermosa Beach, you know, which is like Seapoint. But I'm not seeing the cars that I want to see in Seapoint. I need to go to Mendenburg, Athlone, or whatever to find these cars that's low riders. You know, it's like, no, 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 we're not going there. You, we're going to get hurt and, you know, get killed or whatever through the different gangs and everything like that. And I said, but I cannot come this far and not go there and find what I need to look for, you know. So I rented the car and off I went. And also, I had a contact number for a guy by the name of Charles, man. And he was a, a, a cousin for Shaquille O'Neal. So he also did auto detailing on a commercial. So we started always speaking and I always had his contact. So I wanted to look him up, man. And eventually, I got to his house and I knocked on the door and I met the family. And they said, no, he's not there. He's just left for a job. So I thought, okay, look, I'm here now. I might as well start moving around in this area. So I moved around, moved around, and eventually I landed up in called the famous Compton that you always hear in the music videos, you know. So now I'm getting to see shops. I need to see the wire wheels. I need to see all these things, you know. And I met some people there, and I asked them, look, I'm here to learn. And, and they were like, that's weird. You, you fly for 14 hours all the way from Africa to come and do what? I said, I'm here to clean your shop, to wash your toilets, to, to make you coffee and tea. And I, all I want in return is knowledge, man. You don't have to pay me. So they said I must have come back the next day. And when I got there, the following day, I met his brother, spoke to him about the same thing. And his brother said, cool, he'll give me an opportunity to work here. And when he opened up the doors, it was a huge warehouse and they were manufacturing wire wheels. So, so the wire wheels are the spoke wheels that these low riders drive with me. And they were assembling them there and making them, you know. So I spent like some time there working um, and, and learning how they assemble these things. And when he felt what the time was right, he took me to a hydraulic shop, which was called um, Custom um, Hilo Hydraulics. So when I went there, I, then I was blown away because now I'm seeing the cars, you know, and I'm seeing how all these things are working. 
So what happened there again, as he's taking me through the shop, um, I see this one specific car, a 63, 1963 Chevy Impala. And I just shook my head and he's telling me what they're doing to this car. And I said, you know what, without um, joking, but this specific car, my friend is an Ebras artist in, in Cape Town, Madsville Custom, Jeremy Nolan. And he Ebras that specific car on his own because we admired that car. And now I'm in California and I actually see that car. So I start crying, you know, like there's a tear running at the back. I have because this is very emotional for me because it's always been a dream, but I'm finally achieving it. You know? And there's a little guy come walking in and his name is Cheech, like in the movie Cheech and Chong. And he's like, hey man, why is this guy crying? And they say, no, he's never seen a lowrider before, man. So I'm like, you guys won't believe the way I'm feeling. I'm shivering, I'm, 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 I'm crying. So he said, we, they got to take me to Las Vegas to go and see more lowriders. But I'm going to probably need a towel because I'll be crying the whole day, you know, if, if that's how I feel. So then I spent some time there. Um, then I got to, to, they taught me how to install these hydraulics, how it all works. Um, I've met amazing people there. They couldn't believe that I came all the way from Africa. And before I left, I got a set of hydraulic pumps. I got wire wheels. I came back to uh, South Africa um, with these things, you know. But I was so scared it was going to get stolen on the plane, you know, because, I mean, I've worked so hard for it. You know, I've come this far. So I would turn my boxes inside out so no one can read what's inside the boxes. Um, I would carry the pumps with me. And when it went through the machine and... Uh, they saw what it was. It looks like a, a tube, you know, so it doesn't look very good to go onto a plane. So I had to explain what it is. And eventually we came to South Africa and I, I got it in the country. And then the whole dream started to rebuild this Impala, which I had, which I was in 1964. Because they taught, told me that if you can't do it properly, then don't do it. You know, so with the money I had, I, I stripped the car again, I rebuilt it. And with the help of a lot of friends in Cape Town, everyone doing specific things, we, we, we got to build, I think, the first lowrider for South Africa. And uh, we achieved it, and we launched it onto the streets of Cape Town on USE for 2000. And Cape Town just went mad because they've never seen that before, a car coming down the street, doing all the fancy stuff, you know, hopping and stuff like that, you know. But um, that was a minute to many money. But I'm, I'm, I'm still busy with um, I'm busy building another one now, and now that has become like a family project. I'm, I'm married and I've got kids, so we're all involved in, in, in doing that. And uh, inshallah, hopefully, uh, we'll pull out the next one again, you know. But everything takes time, man. Eh? If, 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 you, if you have the patience and, and, and the willing to work hard, everything will come in its own time towards you, man. What so, was, yeah. What the, the, the bonnet <laughs> had a beautiful uh, uh, um, airbrushed uh, image. Um, I know the familia was in it. Was it the yes. familia or what was it again? Me, familia, which is my family. And then the, the, the airbrush artwork that my friend did, it was all about District 6, basically, the, the Star Cinema. So with my parents coming from District 6, I wanted to keep that history alive, you know. So it was basically where my dad was hanging out and um, I put that all together. So wherever we went, people always asked about the picture. You know, and, and it gave us the opportunity to speak to them about our culture of the okay, six, but what happened there. Like, you know? right. and, um, yeah, I'm not keeping crying, I'm not crying, it's just my eyes are tearing. I'm, I'm, my eyes are tearing, I'm not crying, it's just <laughs> my eyes are tearing because uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what. <laughs> but okay, so, so that was that. <laughs> so that was that amazing experience. So now, now we're going to fast forward quickly to present day. So your company that you yeah. started uh, a couple of years ago called Grip This. Just tell us a bit about Grip This. Grip This, we started in, I think, um, 1998. Eh? So it's quite a long time ago because before I went to the States, myself and Mark Foster, we joined up together with our knowledge to make it uh, a small company to produce and to provide a service to production companies. And then two years later, my brother, he had, uh, he joined us, and um, the three of us have been together ever since up till today, you know. So we, we are a small company in Cape Town, um, and we offer that service of gripping, grip work, you know, with our crew members. Um, we also got equipment. We got our own vehicles, trucks, cars, 
Uh, we've also gone into remote heads now as well. So we can offer anything that, that wherever the camera's got to go, we can try and offer them that kind of service, basically, you know. So from normal small packages to large packages, uh, small teams, big teams, um, like I say, camera cars, remote heads, uh, dolly work, crane work, we, we can offer all that kind of services to commercials, music videos, uh, and feature films as well now. What advice do you give yes. people, especially people from Kensington, where you're from, Athlone, you know, where, uh, you know, what kind of advice can you give them with regards to first follow, following their dreams and then and, and looking at maybe your industry as, as, a, as a place to follow those dreams? Um, sure. I, I think it all starts with a dream. Like I always say, you know, whatever dream you have, um, if you're serious about it, man, it will come your way. Even if it means it takes, sure, until you the age of 50 before you actually see it, you just have to keep on working hard towards that, man. And if, if we can motivate that in every youth out there, I think we'll have made a lot more successful people out there because they keep on striving because I think over the years, there's a lot of people that start that dream and then they start fading out. No, it's taking too long. They don't have the patience for it. But if your dream is what you love doing, then time is not something that you'll be watching. You know, like I, I say with my daughter as well, when she does, you know, uh, hip hop dancing and stuff like that, she can dance for hours. I can work for hours. Like you say, we work 12 hours a day. Sometimes we work 18 to 20 hours a day. Um, but if, if you really enjoy what you do, you're never going to look at your watch and go like, what time is it? When is it five o'clock? I want to go home now. What time is lunch? You just keep on working because that is where your passion lies. So for me, like I say, if, if you want to do what we are doing, um, it, it takes a very unique person to be in the film industry. Like you would know it's early morning, it's long hours, you don't see your family. So people think, oh, you guys are in the film industry, it's like Hollywood lifestyle. It's not like that. You know, if, if you can go through the hardship first, like you say, PAing and you're having to go into a river at three o'clock in the morning because you've got to build a platform in the water. You don't know what's in the water, it's all dark, you know? So it's scary sometimes. But if, if you've got that willpower to go like, I want to do whatever it takes to get to achieve that dream, then you are the right person to get into the industry. You know, work hard, don't get upset. There are going to be a lot of challenges. People are going to throw things at you and, and, and try to get you involved in good things or bad things. But you got to have a strong willpower and a, like we say, a strong mind to say, that's not right for me and I'm prepared to do this. But if that's what it takes, you know, you got to decide if it's what you want to do to achieve that specific goal in life, you know. So hard work, um, always respect people, stay humble and kind, and, and respect, yeah. You know, I, I, it's going to take you a long way. If you're an honest person and they can rely on you, then you're going to get wherever you want to be in life, no matter what job or what career you're going to go into, basically. Yeah. Shukran so much for your time. Shukran for sharing your story with us. Um, I really, I really, really appreciate your, your, your energies and the fact that you helped me on, on, on my career of helping people, uh, teaching, sharing knowledge. So shukran so much. I really appreciate sure. it. Shukran so much for, no, for taking this time to share, share your story with us. Yeah, no problem. Shukran to you, man, for giving me this opportunity to speak to people. And like you say, there's people out there that needs to know things. You know, if I can help them, by all means, you know, send them my way. If, if I can't do it, I will try and guide them in a different way to say that is the route you have to take and you need to find your destination. You know, all of us got different paths in life, you know, and we are here for specific reasons. And I guess if, if we can help our, our people out there to make them stronger with knowledge, then yeah, why should we keep the knowledge to ourselves? We need to expose other people to what we do, you know, and like you say, show them that there's other things out there as well, besides just the norm that we grow up with every day, basically. But Alhamdulillah, you know, we are blessed. And shukran to our creator, you know, for granting us this opportunity that we can do what we do and uh, still provide for families. Alhamdulillah. Shukran to you with that. Appreciate the interview. <laughs>